This is 9-11 Freefall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of 9-11 Free Fall. I'm the host, Andy Steele. Guest tonight is Greg Covington. He's a construction contractor. He's going to be talking about that high-rise fire they had in Dubai last week. It was on New Year's Eve. A hotel lit up like a torch in the night. And guess what? It did not collapse in mere seconds because of the random fires. Not even random fires. I mean, this thing was lit up. So we're going to be comparing that with what we saw on September 11th, 2001, where the three uh, World Trade Center buildings, and uh, I'm going to do a little bit of comparing and contrasting, talking about what uh, should have happened on 9-11 if they hadn't put explosives in the buildings to bring them down. So I'll be playing that interview for you uh, a little bit later tonight in a few minutes. Uh, before I do, though, I just want to remind everybody that we are right now living in interesting times, historical times. A big move is being made against the official story by the 9-11 Truth Movement, led by architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth on this project. Of course, I'm talking about the World Trade Center 7 evaluation, the making of a computer model that is going to test NIST's hypothesis, whether or not thermal expansion of beams can push the girder off its seat, if a single column failure can really bring down a 47-story steel frame high-rise in seven seconds. We're going to be testing lots of different theories on what happened to World Trade Center 7. It's going to be an independent analysis done uh, right out in the open, right out uh, transparent for everyone to see. How about that? And you can give your input on it. You can be a part of this process. The way to do that is by going to WTC7Evaluation.org. Do it right now. Check it out. Check out the videos that are on the site. A lot of great information there. You can get a short uh, two-minute introduction to the uh, whole project, which I'm going to be playing for you before I play the interview. This evening, I've played it in previous broadcasts, uh, but it's also got lab videos, and these lab videos are really interesting, especially for the really uh, technical people out there who are wanting to participate and give their insight uh, to this project. Uh, the videos consist of Dr. Halsey sitting with his students that are helping him out, uh, essentially live blogging as they do the work. So uh, if you're interested in seeing that aspect of it, you can check those out. You can also see lectures by Dr. Halsey that he's given already, some an hour long. Uh, interesting stuff. So you can uh, see all of the work that's being put into this model. Now compare that to NIST, which says that if they release their data to you, it's going to jeopardize public safety. Who are you going to believe? Model versus model. This is going to be a historic development, and you can be a part of it. You can give your insight, but you can also, if you don't really know how to construct computer models, you can help out by donating, uh, becoming a monthly supporter. Uh, if you go to WTC7Evaluation.org, it will tell you how you can do that because, uh, you know, obviously these projects are not free. Uh, they cost money, and we need help with that. So, you know, be a part of this historic undertaking and contribute monthly until the project is completed in April of 2017. All right, again, this is a completely open and transparent investigation into the cause of World Trade Center Building 7's collapse. And just as it says here on the website, every aspect of the scientific process will be posted at WTC7Evaluation.org and on the university's website so the public can follow its progress. All right, can't get any more transparent than that, folks. So be a part of it, donate if you can, and uh, just follow the project all the way till that magic time in April of 2017 when we can lay it all on the table. My name is Leroy Holsey. I'm a forensic engineer and a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Steel is a very fire resistant material. When a structure fails, my job is to figure out why. Over the next year, with a team of PhD students, I will be rebuilding World Trade Center Building 7. How does floor 13 respond with respect to 12? Using the same drawings that were used to build it originally, we will reconstruct it virtually. 
Our goal is to figure out why it collapsed late in the afternoon on September 11, 2001, even though it was not hit by an airplane. The investigation conducted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology concluded what we found was that uncontrolled building fires caused an extraordinary event. The collapse of World Trade Center 7 was primarily due to fires. Our investigation will evaluate the probability that this was the cause of the collapse. We are making this study open and transparent. Whether you are a physicist, engineer, architect, fire expert, or a specialist in another field, or just an ordinary citizen, we want your participation. We are making all of our data available online. Every aspect of our process regarding the modeling will be shared. And we will be giving regular updates from the lab as we continue our work. Join us in getting to the bottom of why World Trade Center 7 collapsed on September 11th, 2001. All right, before I play my interview with Greg Covington, we're going to do what we do every week. We're going to take 10 seconds of silence to remember the victims of 9-11 and their families and all the people who died in the wars that followed 9-11. We're going to do that beginning now. And that is 10 seconds. The views expressed on this show by guests and the hosts on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Greg Covington has his own contract construction business. In the past, he's worked with Boeing, Raytheon, and other companies. He's written recently about the Dubai high-rise fire that took place on New Year's Eve last week. He'll be talking about that some more on this show. Uh, Greg, welcome to 9-11 Freefall. Well, thanks for having me. It's a real honor and privilege to be welcomed into this uh, venue and participate in this forum. Well, and I, I met this uh, gentleman, I'm telling the audience right now, uh, last week on the conference call for AE 9-11 Truth. A very interesting guy, very fascinating uh, to just hear your take on things. So I want the audience, before we even get into 9-11 and all that stuff, to learn more about you. So please elaborate on that short biography I just gave. Uh, fill in any gaps that I left out. Well, sure. Uh I'm not accustomed to doing that, but I want to make sure people know who I am and you know, verify in their own minds and hearts uh, that they're receiving information from a trustworthy source. Uh, yeah, I am uh, reside in the Little Apple, Manhattan, Kansas. Um, I basically was raised in Kansas, although I did live all over the country as a nomad throughout my life. I like to consider myself a Midwesterner with these kinds of values and ethics, looking out for neighbors. So I do speak plain English. <laughs> so uh, my background, though, uh, the best way to describe it, I suppose, so people really get, get the feel for what I'm about and who I am, is that ever since I was just a, a, a young tyke, uh, I would always be interested in helping my grandfather and my father with projects around the house, rental homes, handyman repairs, that type of thing. And so I was always interested in knowing how to fix things. I got intrigued by woodworking. Uh, in junior high, took several woodworking classes, got uh, into auto technology and hands-on mechanic work. Anything that involved technical science and education, knowing about my planet and about the world around me and nature and the materials that man used to better his life, uh, as well as developing the skills with my hands, my eye-to-hand -hand coordination, knowledge, and, and then honing some skills, trying to become a craftsman as a goal, you know, an artisan, if you will, at some point. So that, that's really my core enthusiasm that, that drives me, other than basically truth. Everybody has their own truth, so I have kind of segued away from that and start referring to things as factual. I'd rather know the facts than the truth, because everybody knows the truth, their own truth, right? 
Exactly. That's something that we all need to be uh, vigilant of and diligent in our pursuit of. In fact, uh, one of my favorite quotes, I use it as a signature on my emails commonly, is from a, uh, a scholar who was well-trusted by the ruling class uh, back in Rome. Uh, his name was Cicero. Uh, one of the quotes I love from him is, the first duty of a man and of the king is the seeking after and the investigation of truth. I think we would all be better served if we were to really genuinely pursue multiple sources of information and try to use our own cognitive reasoning abilities and think through uh, what we're hearing. And then at the end of the day, what we need to weigh that against is known irrefutable laws of our universe, of our planet, of our life as we know it. Things that have never been disproved, things that we can rely on. You have to have an anchor. You have to have a focal point against which to weigh all these things that we learn or we think we learn. That's how you arrive uh, at truth, in my view. You have to really be willing to uh, investigate and review ample quantities of information and then hone it down, and reject the, the ridiculous, you know, the extremes on either end, and work your way to the middle, and, and again, use the laws that, we, that are irrefutable as your foundation. So uh, I guess I'm kind of uh, digressing a little away from the main theme. I'm trying to introduce who I am, and I'm getting into philosophy, but that's who I am. <laughs> so That's all right. As far as my, uh, I, I would like to touch back on that in a minute, but uh, let's kind of wrap a string around my professional qualifications so people understand that, when I speak of things about Dubai fires and structures and steel and buildings and construction, that I've done my due diligence in pursuing uh, knowledge and education and, and awareness on many levels. Uh, beyond what I already talked about, I pursued uh, a career uh, in engineering. Uh, I was a draftsman as a 17-year-old punk and <laughs> learned to become a design detailer after a few years and was developed more skills and knowledge about all kinds of systems and equipment and, and design standards for many things. Uh, and I'm, I'm in debt to several very important, impassioned mentors in my life. Uh, when I worked at places like Western Electric out in Lee Summit, Missouri, I worked at, at uh, a subsidiary of the Boeing Corporation, Boeing Engineering and Construction Engineers Incorporated. That's a mouthful. But that's where I was in Wichita, Kansas, Seattle, suburbs of Seattle for a while back in the 80s. These mentors helped me understand design concepts uh, where the rubber meets the road, where you're really trying to design piping systems, high pressure, 4,000 PSI hydraulics, for instance, or perhaps air handling systems, dual duct of variable air volume, um, heating and cooling systems for commercial buildings. I was intrigued by all that stuff, and I got to learn from the bottom up, hands on, exactly how you design it and why, what what kind of data you put into your programs and how you uh, evaluate the results and make proper changes and adjustments so you really hone the system to be efficient and uh, serve people and be durable. So there, there, my career, after 14 years of doing this and actually be, being uh, promoted to the position of project engineer by... Uh, office manager for the Boeing group I worked for. Uh, I had been working in the field as a construction coordinator, someone who would do design work on the board the old-fashioned way, <laughs> graphite pencils and, and uh, templates and triangles and all that kind of stuff, uh, fancy lettering, you know, uh, an art of a bygone era. Uh, I was proud to have participated in that. But my point being, I, I participated on a technical level as a designer, as a field uh, inspector and surveyor. And then after the drawings were produced, I'd go to the field and make sure the contractors were installing it per plans and specifications. Isn't that what architects and engineers do? Sure. Exactly. I'm thrilled by all of that, Andrew. <laughs> it was my it was my bailiwick. It's, it's where I belonged as a liaison a participant on technical and uh, practical uh, you know, influence here. I, I refer to myself as a guy that was... Uh, suits and boots, so to speak, so, uh, you know, ties on, on certain days and participate in conference room meetings and the design room discussions around a drafting board uh, to going to the field and getting my 
steel-toed boots and safety goggles and hard hats and Nomex suits and clipboards and tape measures, <laughs> you know, going to the field. <laughs> it's a good way to get out of the office and break the monotony there sometimes, but the point being is that I'm comfortable in both worlds and I feel I belong there. So my awareness of, of those things really was, was honed in the School of Hard Knocks, and I'm indebted greatly to these fine mentors that, that helped me. I realized I needed more formal education to, in order to be welcomed into positions where I could be paid at levels that were commensurate with my knowledge and uh, my experience. Because without a sheepskin, the industry just doesn't look at you the same way. So I took a hiatus from my 14-year career. I was uh, almost 31 years old, and it was a scary time in my life, a, a challenging time, but I decided I better do it now while well, I had some money in the bank and the enthusiasm and, and uh, the desire and encouragement. So I went back to college uh, took my freshman year at Wichita State University, so I was a shocker first, but then I transferred to Kansas State University the following year and enrolled in their College of Engineering and pursued uh, my degree in Construction Science Management. And I was thrilled to be able to learn from PhD uh, professors in physics and the construction sciences, uh, particularly uh, when you talk about the core curriculum of theory of structures, mechanics and strengths of materials. Then specific design courses in, in timber design, steel design, concrete design, uh, besides other, other very interesting courses about soil foundations and things. But the point here is that I really did get this very uh, organized flow of science knowledge based on Newtonian physics. You know, and that, that's what I last talked to the most. And, you know, the elect electrical Tesla stuff was a little more, you know, <laughs> I got my mind around it eventually, but, you know, you're challenging. So I'm more at home with the physical realm, just put it that way. I think there's a lot of people who studied what you did who had no idea that they'd be put in the center of such a huge issue as we're facing here with 9-11, in particular the controlled demolitions of the three buildings that fell on that day. Uh, so, you know, who would have thought that you would be using this knowledge to uh, uncover one of the biggest scandals in our nation's history? I think a lot of professionals had no idea they'd be put at the forefront of this, and that might be part of the issue that we're facing with this topic. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. In fact, not only would we not expect it, but we would not even welcome it because it's haunting. It, it's, it's really dark. It, when you think about you know, the ramifications and the implications of what must have gone on behind the scenes in order to perpetrate such a, a scandal. And I would, I would comment that it's not just of our nation, but of the entire existence of mankind. This, the scandal and the related operations around that are literally, in my view, you know, quite, uh, well, satanic, if you, if you would allow me. That it is evil. It's the destruction of life and, 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 uh, freedom and sovereignty and, and the blessings that we, we were bestowed upon by uh, you know, the forces of nature. Who, however we gained life, however your beliefs are, call it uh, Mother Nature and Father Time, you know, powers of the universe, life-giving forces. We ha were blessed, and all of a sudden, we have to use this knowledge that we're using to build things for perpetuity. We're trying to build things that are quality, to serve our, our fellow man and our families and our, our, our you know, grandchildren. Let's be honest. We're looking at uh, perpetuity here, right? Look, but all of a sudden, that those factors enter into the same scenario because it's like if you turn your back on what you know in your gut, in your mind, in your mighty computer, in your gray matter, if you ignore that, you really have a problem looking yourself in the mirror. As far as I'm concerned, if you have a conscience and you are ethically grounded, and you must have concerns for not only your own well-being, but that of your friends and family and your descendants and, you know, the future of your culture and, and of life. It, it is that big. It is philosophical, but doggone it, when you look at the implications and what's transpired as a direct result, it's a game-changing uh, series of events for all life as we know it. Well, what gets me about it is that you learn these skills to try to advance civilization, to build up the buildings that people enter in and do their office work in, uh, to make these beautiful skylines that people see as they enter these major cities. 
And that's why we learn it. That's why we learn any of these trades, uh, even doctors, lawyers. You know, they learn it to advance the civilization. That's the expectation. But somebody somewhere, you know, because they obviously knew what they were doing when they set these uh, explosives in these buildings. Somebody somewhere used that knowledge to pull back civilization, to do it in a very tragic way, to do it in a way that uh, has impacted lives uh, countless from that day forward. Not just those who died on that day, but the wars that follow, the people affected by those wars, even if they didn't die. Um, somebody used it for the uh, regression of civilization. And that is something that I think is a huge violation of uh, whatever standards you uh, agree to. I don't know if there's any kind of uh, code that engineers follow when they become engineers, like the doctors have to uh, promise to do no harm. Uh, I think there should be some kind of code if there isn't, but there certainly is an unwritten code. There certainly is an understanding that you are not to use your knowledge to do harm to uh, the civilization that you are in, and somebody somewhere did that. And uh, we're hot on the trail of them with this show and over at AE911 Truth with the work that Richard Gage and uh, the entire team there is doing. How did you wake up to this? Uh, you know, obviously 9-11 is a controlled demolition, but did, did you know from day one, or did it take you time to figure it out? No, I, I recall the event like anybody would. I, I mean, I I remember where I was and what I was doing on the day that, you know, JFK was shot. Uh, I, you know, I remember what I was doing where I was on the day about the Alpha P. Murrah building. Certain events in our lives are indelibly, indelibly etched into our uh, hard drives of our memories. And yes, of course, I remember sitting on the couch watching the news one morning, um, seeing that, that a plane had crashed into the North Tower, and the reports coming in were shocking, of course, and sad, but the, they were uncertain. There was confusion. Uh, some of the reports thought that it was a small uh, commercial jet, uh, or perhaps even a private plane. Somebody veered off course and somehow maybe lost control because it wasn't a cloudy day, it wasn't stormy, and they didn't have impaired vision. I'm thinking, how in the world did they run into the doggone tower? I know that when they built and designed the towers, they, they were concerned about that uh, potentiality, and so they designed the, the building with that in mind, but also because they, they would have all of the surrounding control towers at airports uh, very much aware of these things. Uh, uh, and it's easy to, to go down rabbit holes and digress into so many side stream uh, discussions. So if I get too far off, off topic, please reel me in. But you're asking me about my revelation uh, with the dark side of 9-11 instead of just the paranoia and fear that most people felt. And help me, help me, you know, government, do something, go get, you know, um, the boogeyman. Uh, well, when I saw that the second plane had hit the south tower and that huge fireball you know, exploding outside of the tower. The horror of that and suddenly the realization, wait a minute, you, can't, you can have one anomaly in an accident, but two the same morning within you know, that length of time of each other, what, 20 or 30 minutes apart? Are you kidding me? And that was a big plane, not a small one, so whoa, that was deliberate. Uh, whoever steered that in or however they did it, whatever it was, you know, my goodness gracious. So that might, I had a sick feeling in my stomach because, you know, we'd all been living for several years since the 1993 World Trade Center bombing uh, event down in the parking garage in the basement. And then certainly after the 1995 Alpha Pimura attack that occurred and, uh, and the analysis of that as well, where the uh, delving into it has similarities to 9/11 on many on many levels. But the point being that my mindset was one of, sure, we're concerned about you know blowback, you know the kind of foreign policy decisions that have been made by the CFR and and our Congress and and the controllers uh, of our military and intelligence and CIA all around the planet for for decades. I was very concerned about what the you know terrorist oriented people that might want to do to retaliate against, you know, heinous actions that, that we, in our, you know, our, our nation had perpetrated against the world. So, yeah, there was that fear. There was that sick feeling of, oh, shit, we're under attack. And, you know, regardless of how much I might understand it, of course I don't want it. <laughs> you know, i got friends and family here. I live here. Let's find a peaceful, diplomatic, uh, negotiated solution here and change, everybody change their 
their uh, trajectories. So having seen that, I'm really feeling pretty bummed and, and freaked out. You know, it's not a, an appropriate term. Well, you know, when I saw the building explode at the top, literally erupt in huge flames and fireball and, and pyroclastic dust clouds just emitting and, and then just literally become a 4th of July Roman candle fireworks display for my eyes, the way that it erupted, the energy that was released upward and outward, and as it crumbles with nothing there on the ground, no building left, of course, I knew instantly and that was a very uh, troubling moment. It, you know, for me, it's like, holy shit. That was just blown up. That was taken out by a very sophisticated process. I knew from all of my background since I was 12 years old and everything my life had been directed toward, all the knowledge I had absorbed and proved, told me instantly that that was effed up on a, on, on a major scale. So I was one of those individuals who, you know, blessing and a curse, ignorance is not bliss <laughs> necessarily, but maybe in that instance I could see how people would, if you don't know, then you wouldn't be in trouble to the depth I was. And so I've lived with that reality of knowledge since that instant. And then, of course, over the next two or three years, I engaged in a very active pursuit of more documentary research and watched every video that was put out on the subject and read books and, and uh, you know, gathered all the data. And uh, so my awareness was early, but then the absolute proof was something that I had to build, like any, any dedicated scientist on any level, and I do consider myself a construction scientist. Something that we do know is that fires don't typically bring down high-rise buildings, uh, steel frame high-rise buildings, like they did on the day of September 11th, particularly in the case of Building 7, which wasn't even hit by an airplane. And uh, I saw some stuff you had written about this latest fire in Dubai uh, on New Year's Eve. Unfortunately, I guess some people got hurt during it. Uh, but if there is any kind of, uh, I guess, benefit that we can take out of this tragic event happening, it's that we can observe what is supposed to happen when a fire breaks out in one of these things. So I want to go with your observations because you really uh, lay it out very good. Talk about your initial observations during the Dubai high-rise fire, after it, the one last week, of course, um, and comparing it to what we saw on September 11th. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I had, I had been tracking and been aware of numerous high-rise um, skyscraper fires over the years uh, and then cataloging those, bookmarking them, uh, archiving them, studying them and trying to find the you know similarities and, and dissimilarities and then using those as tools to compare and find out, you know, how do you have evidence available to you in the real world that, that will shine light on what really happened on you know, September eleventh. Particularly as you say with building seven, not hit by a plane, no jet fuel involved at all. Uh, use sporadic fires on two or three floors, minor damage on the exterior facade, certainly nothing damaging the core columns uh, and that structure of the overwhelming majority of that uh, intricate structure. So, yeah, when I saw the Dubai fire on New Year's Eve just last week, I'm thinking, wow, uh, it's an inferno. It literally went from, what, the 20th floor or something all the way up to the, to the top. I mean, and when you, I've seen videos, I've seen pictures, anybody can go look at that, it's archived. Uh, the type of fire that I saw there and the spectrum analysis of, of you know, in my view, and I'm sure there are other experts that, that focus and, and are the ones to talk to about the validity of this observation, not mine. Uh, but when you talk about fire and you have white, yellow, orange, and red color spectrum, the whiter, the yellower, the brighter, the, the hotter the fire, it means it has more oxygen fuel. It has It's burning at a much higher temperature, more complete combustion, and you start getting uh, deeper colors of reds and purples and, and even going to, to the grays and charcoals and blacks, you have a lower temperature fire, uh, and that, that was the primary instantaneous, easily observable difference between World Trade Center 
seven on September eleventh and the Dubai high rise. And what I saw was engulfing you know an entire building and let's don't forget this is about somewhere between twelve and eighteen hours duration. I think if we say fifteen hours it would be in the close proximity of what it was. But they were still battling this fire sometime around nine thirty the next morning and it got set the night before on New Year's Eve for the evening, you know, as part of celebration of fireworks on the exterior balcony, apparently some illegal, you know, setups, whatever it was. The point is that this fire was obviously burning much hotter over a much larger area of the building over a much longer period of time by orders of magnitude. We're not talking about 15 minutes or, you know, an hour longer, many hours longer. Okay, so the uh, the anomaly here that, that most people who are not aware of things on a level that, that I am and other technical experts are, they should be thinking, oh, my God, get everybody away. It's going to fall down. Remember September 11th, when buildings catch fire, they're going to fall down. This is not just a fire. This is a raging inferno. The whole building was a candle. So, you know, why didn't the major news networks for the world set up video cameras on it and broadcast it around the planet and say, here's the next one, you know, because nobody wanted it to fall down and the laws of materials, the laws of physics mean that not only are they not prone to fail and collapse due to fire, the fact is no high-rise steel structure, particularly with, you know, reinforced concrete floors and horizontal beams and purlins and girders, vertical columns that are down in the bedrock and all the way to the top. Not one time before September 11th had any high-rise building collapsed due to fire. You know, qualify again by saying steel structure, you know, maybe some concrete structures, maybe timber structures, sure, different things can happen. But we're talking about specifically comparing this to World Trade Center 7. Very valid comparison. So not ever one time before September 11th did any steel high-rise skyscraper collapse due to fire. And the next important point for people to grasp and hang on to as an anchor, this is a litmus test, not one time since 9-11 has that occurred. Only on September 11th of 2001 did it happen, and it happened to three buildings, two that were hit by airplanes, one it was not. And so there you have a, a, a very fundamental anal you know, comparative analysis there that says something ain't right in River City. What's going on with this? Why? We need to be to get to the end of to the bottom of this. If we're concerned about the welfare of our population and our people who occupy these buildings, how many twenty to forty story buildings are there around the country, around the world? How many fifty to eighty story buildings are there? They are all apparently in imminent danger of complete and total collapse if a fire breaks out. Now, we found out the next day in the smoldering remains that the Dubai Hotel is called the address or the address uh, was still standing. It hadn't collapsed. So, what a shocker. That needs to be brought forward into the mainstream view of the planet so people can see what happens when you have a raging inferno that consumes the entire structure, not just, you know, six to ten floors on the, the upper ten percent of the building like they were on the towers or just a few sporadic fires on two or three floors as they were on the Solomon Brothers building on that day. So, you know, th there you have it. You have to go back and be a forensic an uh, analyst. You have to be a detective. You have to be an engineer. You have to be a scientist. And be diligent. Be genuinely truthful to the data. You have to Invest yourself in the data first if you're ever going to arrive at anything that resembles the truth. So that that's what I saw in Dubai, and I, I, of course I already knew it wasn't going to collapse. Uh, but that's a, it's it's an indicator to the world, and it, and so it should be a wake up call, and it needs to be exploited for that reason, just as much as 9/11 and those uh, events have been exploited by forces beyond our control at the moment. We need to push back with truth and data and say, hey, guys, what about this? Why no concern from you? Why no coverage of this? And what's your 
your take on the comparisons. Why did Building 7 collapse and why didn't Dubai? I, I saw a picture on some article uh, in which it shows the next morning after the fire's put out, it shows a regular person walking down the street and you see the building standing there. It's big and charred and ugly, but it's still standing. And of course, that's not what we saw with September 11th. And typically, or what we should be expecting from a truly independent media, supposedly, yeah, right, uh, is them making these comparisons, saying, well, why didn't the building fall down the same way we saw it on 9-11? Uh, what's your take on the media not covering this obvious and glaring problem with the World Trade Center story compared to this latest fire last week? <laughs> well... Oh, goodness. You have opened up a can of worms there. What, what I've seen uh, in my lifetime uh, is an unfortunate consolidation going back to the, the monopoly. We were supposed to have outlawed monopolies in this country, hence the breakup of the uh, number uh, Ma Bell and all the baby bells back in the 70s. We were getting away from monopolies, right? Well, shit. We've consolidated things on a corporatized government world standard to where the corporations are the monopolies, and they set it up that way. When I think about the independent news, uh, you, it, it doesn't involve the six major players of almost 90, 95% of the, of the media reports that we get, supposedly called news. You know, people like, shit, no, they're not people, goodness, Citizens United has got me <laughs> affected. They're not people. <laughs> they're, they're vaporous entities, corporations, uh, GE, News Corp, Disney, Viacom, Time Warner, CBS. Those six corporations own and control and are gatekeepers for the vast majority of information that is dispersed. And I must say it's misinformation, disinformation, propagandized. It's talking papers that are developed by think tanks and other uh, people from governments around the world that are handed to, to these corporations and and they all just march in lockstep. And the funny thing is, a guy like John Stewart on The Daily Show, which I, I miss, but he used to uh, make a habit of, of having these, uh, uh, what would you call them, um, montages, I suppose, of sound bites and video clips of various politicians and newscasters from around the world. And they would be like three to ten seconds each, and they're all repeating the identical words in a phrase. It's not just one or two words. They have obviously been given the same script. It is a Holly Weird script when it comes to CBS, MSNBC, faux new Fox, I'm sorry, Fox, FAUX, UX news. You name, pick your poison. You want to go to the mainstream media and get on TV and, and sit in your Barker lounger and push your remote control and listen to Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity and Chris Matthews and Brian Williams and Whoever, pick your poison. These people have talking papers and talking points. And so there is no real independent news media that exists other than a few stalwart, courageous, independent producers around the country that we have on small newspapers and the Internet, of course. The Internet, you have to be careful. My advice is go to 10, go to 15, Go to 20 sources. Oh, oh, my God, it takes time and effort. Yep, okay, so is it worth it? Well, you decide for yourself. And once you do, you start learning which of the sites are providing documentation, backup, verification. Hello, we're talking scientific analysis here, even on the news, guys. Yes, it's a burden, but it's, it's, a, it's a labor of love if you love freedom and democracy and, and uh these kinds of life that we envision that we're supposed to be leading. So, yeah, you're, at, you're asking about the news media, and I'm very jaded there because I believe they are prostitutes. They've sold their soul to the devil. Uh, they're probably getting very nice stipends and, and houses and, and uh, bonuses and oh, whatever. Just, yeah, but okay, so they get to live, you know, the Temple of Mammon, and uh, they get to, that's based on their greed. Well, I think it's funny that on every single news story that I've seen about this Dubai fire, which I haven't seen a lot of them from the corporate media. Now, I didn't know about this when it was going on. Somebody told me about it sort of after the a fact when it was coming towards its end. But every news story I've come upon that has any kind of comment posting 
has a zillion comments from people like us saying, hey, why didn't it collapse in seven seconds like Building 7? You know, according to NIST, this should be coming down in everybody's heads, making these comments uh, overwhelmingly. And I just see a disconnect between the government and media, what I always term as the establishment, just kind of lump it all together for simplicity's sake, and the people. It's just a complete rift between these two factions, <laughs> these factions that think they control uh, thought in the mainstream world versus everybody else. And so, just in your own view, how long do you think our society, our society excuse me, can survive with this disconnect existing between the people and government slash media? i got to tell you, I, I believe our society is already... Um, in the grip of death rows. I don't believe it exists today the way people seem to want to believe it does. If you have any faith in what the Constitution says, and, uh, if you have any faith in what we're, you know, people say at, the, at a podium, uh, I think it's all smoke and mirrors. I think we're already well underway into a subversion of what this country is supposed propped up to be. It's a facade, and I'm very much concerned about that. So my first response is, I think it's <laughs> we've already passed over that barrier, and we don't exist like we think we do, but I believe that we still have time if enough people wake up, and with some of my good friends that, that I, I share with, uh, many thoughts and people I, I treasure in my life, We've collectively come up, you know, refer to this as an upwising. You know, yeah, think of Elmer Fudd, think of Bugs Bunny, I don't care. <laughs> if you need to put a cartoon avatar, so be it. Life is short, and let, let's do smile and laugh about it, even if it's a serious issue, but then let's get back to the business of the day. And that is, we need an upwising. We have to get more people away from this uh, droned-in message, you know, that they're being know, bombarded with, and if we don't, the media is culpable in any criminal activity that's been going on with respect to things like, you know, the Kennedy assassination, Alpha P. Murrah, 9-11, etc., etc., uh, all these free, supposed free trade treaties that are, you know, corporate <coughs> contracts where they just wrest control away from Congress and, the, and we the people, um, they, it's already underway. We need to wake up enough people to say, stop it, and we're going to rely on people on the inside in our military. In, yes, the military industrial complex, we've got to have true oath keepers and people who are aware of things on a very deep level on the inside. We will be reliant on a contingent of those people in strategically located places that can perchance uh, ensure the survival, or the, the chance for survival of some semblance of what this country started out to be. But... Uh, yeah, without the media, uh, we would be uh, much uh, disencumbered with uh, falsehoods. Uh, we, or should I say, if we were to take back our media, say, let's have Thomas Paine <laughs> reincarnated, <laughs> have some common sense, uh, uncommon in these days, but uh, we need to reestablish a truly independent media that has investigative journalists that have pride in that. Yeah, I had this observation one time when I was at a video store. Uh, a lot of these are going out of business video stores, and I just noticed that as that happens and as people turn to things like Netflix and all of that, we're all getting what we experience through the flickery blue box is being consolidated so that we have shared experiences now, whereas 100 years ago, you didn't necessarily have that kind of shared experience. Uh, we all, like if everybody watches a movie about a boxer, let's say, um, it's like we all experienced that. We all watched the same movie and, you know, seen the same scenes and seen the actors play the same person. Whereas like back a hundred years ago, it might have been the same story, but you might have seen a slightly different portrayal of it in one area of the country versus another. And so when you have this shared experience, there's a good opportunity to educate the public or... Uh, misinform the public and create a collective wall of resistance to truth, and like we're seeing with 9-11. Uh, people have learned to defer their judgment to experts on television 
and simply trust them and think that anybody that is contradicting those experts on television uh, is wrong, regardless of whatever the argument is. So, yeah, I, I've seen this. I've made these observations before, and it is a problem, especially with the increasing consolidation of what everybody reads, watches, and listens to in this country. Uh, getting back to Building 7, we've had people make this point here, is that if you were to believe the official explanation of what happened to Building 7, that would mean that firefighters are now in great danger that they can't go in and fight fires in steel frame high-rises because the building could have a column failure any moment and bring the entire thing down in seven seconds on their heads. So what's your take on that? Uh, you know, the fact that the, the official story leaves these firefighters in this dilemma that they can't fight fires uh, safely. Very good question and very vital area of focus for all those people who haven't woke, awakened yet, that should be a, a very uh, critical factor for them to resolve. You know, when we have failures like that that have never happened before and we start out to saying, oh my gosh, we, we need to find out who the perpetrators were so we can prevent the terrorists, whoever they are, from doing this again, so we got to figure out who they were and you know, how they did it, and then, as a responsible professional in architectural engineering uh, you know, life, don't you owe it to yourself, your professional integrity, to the people that you ostensibly serve, to find out what we need to do differently in our design and in our construction and maybe even modification of existing structures so we can hopefully not have a similar thing happen to other buildings? That should be front and center, those two issues. But oddly enough, those are the very things that get washed away. We go oh, look forward. We don't we got we got this other we got ISIS, we got this, we got you know Boston, we got, you know, France, whatever we got, we got more distractions and no need to look here. Oh yes, there is. That's at the core. That's at the essence of what architects and engineers do. And public servants in that field have a trust. They have been entrusted with the public welfare and by gosh they have an oath of office and a delegation of authority and this is where I can get incensed because these people have turned a blind eye to their ethical and moral and professional responsibilities in this regard. Now, why do I say that? Because we have not endeavored collectively to say let's find out who really did this and get to the bottom of it, let's analyze the, each collapse, each calamity, and figure out how it happened, and then let's modify our building codes, let's, let's modify some buildings, let's reinforce this or that, whatever we got to do. That should be at the top of the list, and it's not. So, ding, 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 hey, warning, Will Robinson, danger, danger, that is absolutely something that needs to be illuminated. Because that's what that's what these professional organizations should be doing, and, and they're not. Things like NIST and, and you know, other AR, AIA, for instance, uh, professional engineering uh, groups. But here it falls on people like Richard Gage and, and uh, Kevin Ryan, Stephen Jones, you know, David Ray Griffin. <laughs> you know, stellar scholarly people who have devoted their lives to their sciences, and and here they're, you know. They're analyzing it for people and genuinely being truthful, impassioned, opening themselves up to peer review, saying, okay, this is what I see and it bothers me. What do you got? You know, that's a roundtable discussion. That's brainstorming. That's solving these problems so we can make life safer for everybody. Uh, my, my take is that uh, obviously that's another indicator that the people up at the top, the puppet masters, whoever they are, pulling the strings of the people at the podium and on the news, don't want our attention to be focused on what it would take to fix it so this wouldn't happen again, because they just want us to forget about it at all. That's why we don't see the coverage on Dubai like we should, because it's, it's absolutely a stark contrast to what we saw in 9-11 for very good reasons. The laws of science were not 
upheld. They were absolutely subverted by the official narrative of what supposedly happened to Building 7, or the towers. We were talking the other day, and I think this is a very critical thing to push with people since there are so many distractions and there are so many rabbit holes to uh, run down in this uh, research world. But why, in your view, is it important to stick to the science and the observations like the one you've made about the Dubai fire and not go off onto these distractions when talking to others about 9-11? Because the laws of science don't change, and they have not. They've not ever been disproved. 1687, you know, Sir Isaac Newton laws of gravity and um, motion, uh, these are irrefutable. These are things that we have to weigh everything else against. And when you see obvious anomalies that, that refute and subvert those realities and those truths, then you know already that those can't stand. Something's wrong with that picture. This is what we do in the world of science. Uh, you have to have your anchor. You have to have your truth. And that is the data, the forensics, and, and the laws of science. That is what we have to go by. Otherwise, uh, you know, they've got a big job to explain how these laws of, of uh, the universe have, were subverted on one day and then put back into the right orbit again the next day miraculously. So it's because if you're pursuing truth, you have to do it through forensics. And if you may, if you would allow me, it's a perfect segue to kind of summarize some of my philosophy on this. And it goes back to Cicero, where we began. It has to do uh, an ancient uh, Latin term uh, called forensis, and that is the root of forensics. What forensis means or meant in the day was to take before the forum, the forum being you know, the, the great uh, learned scholars in the robes and the sandals uh, orating and talking, debating. So what does that mean, forensics? This is a lost term in our culture, even though we have Jerry Bruckheimer shows out our, you know, wazoo that supposedly show how we use CSI and, uh, you know, forensic evidence and DNA and, you know, all these stuff to analyze and solve crimes. But we are subverting that in our daily investigation of crime scenes and, and evidence. And here, here's what it's about. I mean, forensics means, first of all, the gathering of the data, the factual information in an objective manner analyzing that data, seeing how it stacks up against the known laws of the universe and, and the world you live in. Forensics science is very important as part of crime scene investigation, right? Okay. But there's another very important part to forensics, and they're, they're twins, and they cannot be separated as they are today, otherwise you know, we're doomed. And here's my point. Forensics is also debate. It's also the artful, skillful responsible presentation of your findings of your forensic data analysis. So don't separate those two, folks. Demand, request that people stay true to their forensic research, know what they know, and then analyze that and put it on the table, and then engage in proper, free and open communication and debate, allowing a person to express themselves. Don't shout them down. Don't interrupt them like they do in presidential whatever they are, and, and on news, and about whatever that is. No, forensic debate is critical. And that's what, I'm, what relates back to Newtonian physics to me, because that's what I base my observations of, of uh, WTC7, the Towers, Pentagon, uh, Shanksville, what, any, anything, Alpha P. Murrah, and, of course, Dubai, or the Windsor Hotel in Madrid, Spain, or, or, or the Gosh, the Empire State Building in 1945 with the B-25 bomber that hit up there on the 70th floor or whatever it was, way up high. You have to use forensics in your data, gathering and analysis, and you have to follow through with forensics debate of the findings. You will never arrive at the truth if you don't do that. Just to wrap it up in our last minute here, your thoughts on this. What is the benefit, other than getting a new investigation, which we're striving for and I think we will achieve someday, uh, but what's the benefit of talking about this issue as much as we possibly can over the next several years in this modern day, even though it was 14 years ago? In your view, what's the benefit? The benefit is that people can be reminded that they should not become silly putty uh, in the hands of the controllers of the, the prostitute media and governments, that they have to remain uh, vitalized their sovereign 
mentality, not just their sovereign status, but their spirit, knowledge, and truth. And the pursuit of those things is core. It's central to a fulfilled life, to one when you get done with all of this, you can look back and say, yep, I did my due diligence, I feel good. And as a society, if we allow ourselves to just turn our heads and march in lockstep, like Obama said, don't, no need to look at George Bush or Cheney or Rumsfeld or Wolfowitz or you know, any of those guys, Richard Pearl, you know, Scooter Libby, forget all those guys, Carl Rove, no, 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 Michael Churchill. we don't need to worry about those guys. Look forward, we got work to do over here. If we do that, they are averting our eyes and our attentions, our, our collective consciousness is therefore not looking at the data that's right there in real time in our day and age, and soon it becomes ancient history. It's, it's omitted from the books in schools. They change the definitions and the pictures and the meanings. And, and uh, If we don't collectively engage in these rituals of discussion, and we're going by the, by the wayside, much like our native civilizations of, of our native Indians in this country. I'm proud to say I have some Cherokee heritage, and that's probably one of my redeeming values in my body, uh, my spirit. But the point is that they, they would have respect for the stories of, of their elders, of the ancients, and pass it along and keep it true. Don't make it pass around the room and get like gossip. We have to talk about it so that people understand what's really true, have a litmus test, have something to compare it to as a barometer to what they're hearing elsewhere. If we don't continue to do that, then we all are just acquiescing and we're becoming silly putty where you can just smear it onto the funny papers and peel it up and there you got a picture of, you know, name your cartoon. It, you know, that's what we did when we were kids. It was all good and fun. But in the real world, we can't be that malleable. We can't be that impressionable. We have to be free thinkers. That's right. We don't want to be a silly putty society. I know exactly what you're talking about. I had one of those when I was a kid, and that is a good comparison right there. We don't want to just let the media, the newsprint, make an impression on us and make us like a silly putty in their hands and bounce us all over the walls and make a mess of everything. That is a good comparison, and I wish we could keep on talking, but we are out of time Greg, I want to thank you so much for coming on 9-11 Freefall. It's been my real pleasure. I hope I offered something of, of worth. I know I can ramble. I apologize to all the listeners if they, if they feel that way. I understand. But I mean well. Uh, my spirit's in the right place, and I'm trying to do what I can to enlighten as many people as I can, as well as myself. This program's on every Thursday night on No Lies Radio at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. You can also download MP3s of this show from the Internet Archive by going to 911freefall.com. This is Andy Steele saying have a great week and good luck.